Hello, Miami. This is Real Fight Sports Now, your home podcast and channel for all things Miami sports related. I am Will, and joining us today is our resident Heat expert, Mr. Pre-game Show of the Miami Heat, Mr. Producer of Hawkman and Crowder, and also, actually, wait, let me get it right this time. He is the host of Heat Pre-game. I always mess that one up, <laughs> right? He is the host of Heat Pre-game and post-game as well. Uh, he is producer of the Miami Dolphins broadcast. He's also the host of the Porpoise Pod as well. None other than Mr. Alejandro Solana. What is up, Alejandro? What's up, man? Good to be uh, good to be back here after a nice finals run and uh, a, a much better end to the season than I think any of us were expecting. So it's always a, a pleasure to be on. Thank you, man. I really appreciate. It. We love having you on here as well. And the reason we're talking, we're, we're speaking that way, is because. I want to be honest with the audience. We thought we we're going to be on here sooner. Okay. We both <laughs> thought that the heat wouldn't get past the bucks. All right. But thank God, you know, you're on here later than, uh, than earlier, you know, so that's a good thing. Yeah. Anytime you're, you're recapping the season in late June, it's probably a, a you know, a good indication that things went a lot better than I think any of us expected the last time I talked to you, which was probably like mid March. Right. So, yeah. uh, or maybe a little bit earlier than that. So uh, th- this team definitely, they-, they gave us a good run, man. They definitely gave us a good run. Yeah. What a great run. This is a fun team too. man. I have to say, you know, because it just, it was just so gritty, you know, yeah. and such a tough team. I, mean, I have to quote Mark Jackson because that, that game said, we're going to break it down. But in that game five, he said, man, this is a tough team, <laughs> you know, I mean, but it was incredible, but we have to go over the Miami heat. They were the eighth seed should have been the seventh seed, but they lost that playing game over to, to Atlanta. And then end up beating Chicago with a with 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 some fourth quarter heroics as well, and the season wasn't very good. Okay, it was basically the flip side of last year. The Heat, which were one of the best scoring teams in the NBA last season, um, were one of the worst scoring teams. You know, average uh, actually they were the worst scoring team, averaging 109 points per game, and they were 22nd ranked in three point percentage. Uh, what actually did help them though is that they still remained a top 10 team. So. Alejandro, you know, you, you cover the team, the, the team closely. Like, what do you think went on this season that that made the Heat so inconsistent? Yeah, you know, it's funny because the script was flipped totally. Last year, this team was the one seed. They were able to win all the clutch games and close games down the stretch of the season to hold on to the one seed. And they did it in large part thanks to their three-point shooting. Everybody's talked about it, right? Number one three-point shooting team last year in the regular season It translates to them being the one overall seed in the Eastern Conference at home court throughout the postseason. And then in the playoffs last year, if you remember, their three-point shooting tanked. I mean, it it, it flipped. It went into the gutter. And this year, it was the complete opposite. They're the lowest scoring point per game team in the regular season, as you mentioned. They were bottom five in three-point shooting for most of the season. Things picked up towards the end after the All-Star break a little bit when things started clicking a little bit better for them in terms of shooting and scoring wise. Um, And then in the postseason, you know, that first round against the Bucks, I mean, they're shooting, they're shooting like historic highs from deep. You saw it a little bit as well in the Boston series. So the script kind of flipped for them. And, you know, it's funny because we're doing this, uh, this podcast, the day we're recording the day that Pat Riley at his end of season press conference. And I think, you know, he, he said it best today where, um, there was a little bit of, you know, the mixture of injuries, right? So many guys in and out of the lineup. Um, Jimmy Butler, Kyle Lowry, uh, Duncan Robinson had his hand surgery. Um, and then I think even coming into the season, they expected Omer Yurtsevin to have a bigger role. And he has to miss like the first five months of the season because of a foot injury or an ankle injury. Um, I mean, we can go down the line, right? A laundry list of injuries where guys were in and out of the lineup. And then... Um, you mix that with just a team that underperformed. They didn't shoot the ball as well as they were hoping they would. And all the guys that they kind of banked on to take that next step in progression, Max Struess, Gabe Vincent, Caleb Martin during the regular season, uh, Duncan Robinson even. Um, you, you didn't see that until the postseason. You didn't see any of those guys really elevate their game on a consistent basis. There were moments of brilliance throughout the season, Right individual moments of brilliance but all season long it was jimmy and bam getting to the free throw line it was jimmy and bam attacking the paint you knew that was a given every single game you were going to get that and then you were always just looking to see which of the role players were going to have their hand in any particular game and you knew it was either going to be one of 
Max Struess, Gabe Vincent, Caleb Martin, um, and then, you know, nobody else consistently contributing. And I think that that played a huge part in just a team that underperformed in a big way in the regular season. But even when you and I spoke, um, I remember saying, there's clearly another level to this team. We just haven't seen it yet. And then they add uh, Kevin Love and Cody Zeller. And you could tell there were games where they would play and they would knock down their shots and things seemed to click. But then, I mean, you you brought me in here and you said they were the eighth seed. They should have been the seventh seed. I mean, this team should have been the sixth or the five seed if yeah, we're being absolutely. 100% honest. Yeah, you think about true. those two losses to Brooklyn, the one right before the All-Star game, right? They get blown out in the second quarter. Uh, Mikal Bridges doesn't miss. And then the one at home late in the season where Miami plays Brooklyn very well. And then in the second half, they get blown out of the water. That's when you kind of you kind of knew play-in game was inevitable at that point. I mean, they win those two games against Brooklyn. There's a couple other games that we could go over as well. Uh, the the New York loss where um, they, they lose on a buzzer beater. Yeah, by Julius uh, Randle. Julius Randle, yeah. right? Like there, there's a couple games where um, you know, you can kind of point to and say this team shouldn't have been in the playing game. They're, they're, they were too talented to be in the playing game. And ultimately, because they lost a lot of games that they shouldn't have lost, the Detroit, the Pistons lost, uh, we can go through a, a, a ton of games where you say to yourself, this team shouldn't have lost to X team. They found themselves in a situation where, you know, they had to play in to get into the playoffs. And then they get creamed by the Atlanta Hawks. And you were kind of, you know, saying to yourself, I think all of Heat fans were saying to yourself, like, oh, no, like, just let this season end. Because for whatever reason, this team cannot figure it out against the Hawks of all teams, right? The team that you've dominated now going back two seasons, you took them out in five last year. We were the alleged Trey Young stoppers. We had mm-hmm. to figure out how to uh, how to contain Trey Young, keep him out of his game. And then it's Clint Capella just dominating you on the glass. Um, and then, you know, you're down two points or three points under two minutes to go versus Chicago. And as you mentioned, you needed Jimmy Butler heroics late to kind of win that game for you. At, at no point during this season was there ever a, a, a moment from this team where you said, yeah, they're going to beat the Bucks in five. Like there, there was just no, there was no moment there. And as I mentioned, there were small individual moments of brilliance jimmy butler bam at a bio he had his all-star season and then there were some games where you saw a team that got back to their roots defensively and were you know able to generate much better offensive production throughout the course of a game every now and then but there there was never any any moment where you said yeah this team has what it takes to get to the finals because it just never clicked in the regular season and that's, I guess that's why they have to play the games, right? Because everybody, not everybody, but a lot, a, a large pocket of the fan base just wanted them to lose to Chicago. What was the yeah. point? You're going to play the Bucs, you know, just get the number, get the number 14 pick and you have your, your, your chance at that lottery ball falling the right way to get into the top three. And, uh, and look, man, I think we should all be grateful that that didn't happen, right? That somehow they find a way to win that game and they gave you arguably one of the the, the the funnest and and maybe greatest series in in heat playoff history. I'm not comparing it to the title runs, but when you take those out, uh that first round against Milwaukee, I don't think any any Heat fan will ever forget what the Heat were able to do in that series. Yeah, it was just unbelievable because but one of the things that I will say is that the Miami Heat since they've been in the playoffs, you know, quite uh, quite consistently with Jimmy Butler, you know, as captain of this basketball team, they faced the Bucks on quite a number of times, both in the regular season and the playoffs. They also yeah. faced the Celtics quite a bit. And let's just face it, like, I'm sorry, but no one really respects the Knicks. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very blunt with you <laughs> in that regard. Like, everyone, no one picked the Knicks to beat the Heat in that series. But the thing is that you, so you have that that familiarity with the Bucks and also with the Celtics. So in the playoffs, you have to beat them four times. So that's where pretty much that comes into play as well. And even though the Miami Heat had a very under, under underwhelming season this year, you know, per what they did the year before, they always, they did manage to beat the Bucs. They did manage to beat, you know, the Celtics, you know, even Golden State. They managed to beat the good teams on several occasions. So they, they did have it in them, you know, to put in a good run together. But I don't think any of us saw, heck, I don't think even Milwaukee saw 
you know, the avalanche that they would be facing, you know, when they face the Miami Heat in the first round. I think the same thing. They thought they'd blow them out. The funny thing is that a lot of people out in the national sports world were saying that, well, one of the main reasons because Giannis, you know, missed a couple games here and there. But let's not forget the one game that Milwaukee beat the Miami Heat was a Giannis-less game. All right, where they where they where they hit those though they basically hit like a massive amount of threes, you know, yep. in that game. So Miami Heat beat that team fair and square. I mean, come on, 124 points a game against one of the top three defenses in the NBA. You shot 45 percent from three. I mean, you basically blew them out of the gym, you know, in that first round. So and let's face it, I also think the Miami Heat have given us the blueprint how to stop Giannis. Okay, I mean, this guy was an MVP, and they totally shut him down throughout the series. Yeah, I I don't know if I I would agree that they've uh that they've drawn up the blueprint to stopping Giannis. Um, but I'm with you. First of all, a lot of people pick the Knicks, which we'll get into. And I'm I I don't disagree with you. I, that that Knicks team, the fact that people were saying they were that the Knicks are more talented than the Heat doesn't make any sense to me. But we'll get there. As far as the Heat being able to stop Giannis, like I don't think anybody can stop Giannis. I do think it's fair when we talk about this series to add the context that Giannis got hurt in game one and, and missed most of that game. He left early on in the first quarter, Mm -hmm. missed game two, and then was playing a bit hobbled in games three, four, and five. Like, I I think it's fair to, to add that context when you're looking outside of our Miami bubble, but anybody saying that the heat won that series because Giannis was hurt or because Giannis missed two games they, they they just didn't watch the series, right? I mean, it was pretty evident. The Heat were the better team. The Heat had the better um, duo in that series because Bam and Jimmy together outplayed Giannis and Chris Middleton or Giannis and Drew Holiday, whichever duo you want to give credit to over in Milwaukee. And the Heat had the best player overall in that series. Again, I know Giannis missed some time, but the Heat were the better team yeah. through the five games. And you're right. Um, You know, as hot as the Heat shooters got, which was in large part a reason why they were able to win, um, they still stole game one on the road against a team that has one of the deepest benches in the NBA. And then you saw that come to fruition game two, where they tied an NBA record of made threes 25 in that second game and just blew Miami out of the water. But then the game and the series shifts back over to the Heat. They blew them out in game three. In game four, when Giannis makes his return, I mean, Jimmy Butler goes for 56. Like, that's what this team had. They had the best player in the series. And then in game five, I mean, Giannis is back. He's already played two games. And and, and they're up 16 in the fourth quarter. And the Heat are able to storm back as they did all postseason long and as they did against Milwaukee and be the better team down the stretch. Have that, that... that killer mentality of it doesn't matter what situation we're in, we're going to find a way. And I think that perfectly surmises that that series, just find a way to win. And you pair it with historic three-point shooting from guys finally playing above yeah. their level, which is what the Heat were hoping all season long. And let's not forget, they did it without Tyler Hero, who broke his hand on the very first game. And then they did it without Victor Oladipo, who I still think, had he been healthy, not saying he's the difference between between the Heat winning a title or not, but he would have been a huge help in every series that they played coming off the bench, being that extra ball handler, being that extra defensive stopper on the wing. And let's not forget when Jimmy Butler gets taken out by Josh Hart in the second round, they could have loved to have had Victor Oladipo, um, especially Tyler Hero, but Victor Oladipo uh, j- just being that extra you know guy that, that they can rely on defensively to cover some of those... Um, dynamic wing players and 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 ball handlers that Boston then had in the next series. So the Heat also had to deal with their fair share of injury. They were able to overcome every challenge that was presented to them. And what they were able to do against Milwaukee, I'm telling you, it'll go down as, as one of those miraculous series uh, in, in Heat postseason history. It really will. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the reason why I'm just going back a little bit, the reason why I mentioned the blueprint on how to stop Giannis is because Giannis is not the best jump shooter. And what the Miami Heat pretty much did is that they packed the paint and forced Giannis to beat them, you know, with the three ball. 
or or just a basic jump shot and Giannis wasn't able to do that that's pretty much what I mean by the blueprint yeah. to stop Giannis yeah I I, I mean I, I'm with you and 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 I think even before that series it's what we were all doing in 2021 when we played yeah. them and they swept us in the first round you go back to the NBA bubble right where we beat them in five um I, I think a lot of people came away feeling like the Heat are are one of the best teams in terms of their length and versatility centered around Bam Adebayo that uh, uh, certainly have a game plan that they can maximize defensively against Bam, uh, against Giannis. And I think we saw that in the NBA bubble. It didn't work out too well in 2021 when they just mm-hmm. blew out the Miami Heat. Uh, but we've seen this Heat team give Giannis fits. And, and I, I think it comes down to Bam. You know, I really do. I think being able to have a guy that can switch on to everybody on the court at any time. I mean, he's one, a handful of players in the NBA can, car, can guard one through five. Giannis is one of them. Bam is one of them. And yeah. to have a guy like that, and then, you know, to have a guy like Jimmy Butler, to have guys on the floor like Caleb Martin coming off the bench, to have so many guys who are so versatile, um, that, that's, that's a huge help when you're going up against a guy like Giannis who, with one step from the three-point line, can get into the rim. Dude's really good, man. Like he's arguably the best player in the NBA. Him or Jokic would probably be my pick. And uh and, and you're right, like the Heat have figured out a way using their personnel to really, you know, make it tough for him to do the things that he wants to do on the court. But then I also think, you know, we we, we saw a, a player who is not Kobe or or Michael Jordan or LeBron James. Like he's up there in terms of where he's gonna end up being. Uh, legacy wise, I think, because Giannis is going to go down as one of the greatest players in the NBA history, but he is not late game, give him the ball and he's going to go win you a game, step back jumper. Like he's yeah, not, that. not. He, he's not no. that. Right. And that that's not an indictment on him. He does no. everything else. And usually they just blow out teams. And it's not a big deal, but come playoff time when you're up 16 and you need a bucket late because you've blown that lead. He, he, I think the heat, definitely exposed part of Milwaukee's game. And they relied a ton on Chris Middleton to be that for them, right? Come up yeah. with those clutch buckets. Remember, I think it was game two in that first round series where you hit a buzzer beater basically to uh, to, to seal that game against Miami. Um, like they, they exposed parts of Milwaukee that Milwaukee's going to try to uh, to respond with in this offseason by adding different talent as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to minimize Giannis as a player no definitely not I do think he's top three in the NBA you know I mean the guy's extremely versatile but you know let's face it he does have a major weakness and that is a jump shot you know yeah. and and the heat yeah. did force him you know to just like they did in the bubble you know to, to to make that jumper uh just one more thing in the in the season where the heat got swept they also Drew Holiday had a big series against Miami as well if right. we don't forget so that also played a bit of a role why Miami got swept you know as well I think also the heat may have had fatigue because they remember right they literally Played in the finals and then started the season like maybe a month or two later. Right. So it, it was a crazy, it was a that was a crazy time period, you know, for Miami. But yeah, absolutely. You know, Giannis is top three, you know, in the NBA. No taking no, taking that away from him, but the Heat did have found ways to neutralize him, is pretty much they're, what I'm what yeah, I'm trying to say. They're definitely one of the, the the teams around the league that uh that match up better with Milwaukee. Yeah. And uh and and yeah, like I'm not taking issue with what you said. I I just don't I don't believe that there's a a team that can stop Giannis, right? Because who knows if he doesn't get injured in that first game, like who knows, right? What ends up happening. I think part of it is Milwaukee felt after game two, like they don't need Giannis, right? Like uh, they're they're good enough to beat this heat team. I think most people thought that too, even after the heat won both home games, right? And they're up three games to one bucks are still favored in that series. Yeah. So it it goes to show that, um, that, that, you know, because the heat struggled so much, throughout the regular season, especially shooting the three, that nobody actually thought they could close out the Milwaukee Bucks, who were the number one rated team in the NBA throughout the regular season. Uh, Now looking back on it, it's silly because we know what the Heat were able to do against New York, and we know what they were able to do against Boston, and we know the level that Jimmy Butler would elevate to once again in the postseason becoming playoff Jimmy, even though he wants to totally throw out the idea of playoff Jimmy. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, I think the, the one lasting thing we're all going to remember is Jimmy Butler down five, the heater down five versus Milwaukee in that game five closeout game. And Jimmy Butler makes a basket on drew holiday and they're losing with like two and a half minutes left. And he's telling him, I own you. 
I own you. And we've all seen that that uh, that video that went viral after yeah. that game. To have that mindset of Jimmy Butler, you were just down 16. You've come storming back. For him to have that mindset down in a game on the road in the playoffs, telling one of the best perimeter defenders in the NBA, Drew Holiday, I think he was first team all defense this year. Yeah, I own you. Like to have that mentality, he, he's just, he's... He's everything that this organization embodies and more. And yeah. uh and just like have he he it, it's almost like he knew we're we're gonna we're gonna come back. We're gonna yeah, come he, back. And it's it's the Gabe Vincent three pointer, right? Um Eric Spolster holding on to the uh to the challenge because there was a late ball situation where there was an, a a foul called, I think, against the Heat where Chris Middleton just clearly lost it. The Heat ended up getting the ball back. The 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 play that's drawn up where Coach Bo after the game said, Jimmy said, just give it to me. And like, I'll, I'll get it done. And he catches it falling away, sends it to overtime. And then I think it, the, the, the stat, I mean, I haven't read this in a couple months now, right? That this is early or, or mid February or uh, rather April. I think Cody Zeller outscored Giannis in the fourth and in overtime, like just all that coming together to close out Milwaukee was that, that's why I'm saying like, that that's that's serious, man. We're, we'll be able to hold on to that for a long time. Oh, absolutely. And Jimmy is unique, you know, in the sense of the confidence he possesses and how he's just taking ownership, you know, of the team as far as leadership goes and leading by example, you know. And that's why um, he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way everywhere else he was because he's a guy that was counted out, you know. And I personally think, I mean, it's my opinion, of course, that he sees guys with all this talent you know, wherever else he's played and they just take advantage of it, you know, and, and don't put in the work, you know, and so on that he just basically, that's why he, I think he burns what I call he burns the bridges, you know, wherever he's gone, but then he comes into Miami and you're mandated to have a certain uh, percentage of body fat. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Spolstra. If you're over three, he'll bench you. <laughs> you know, it's like you're done or turn off the ball. He, he, like there's, a, there's, there's, there's continuity in order, you know, with the heat, which is something that, that he likes, I would love to be a fly in the wall, you know, when Dwayne Wade was in Chicago and those two were together. And I bet you when you hear Dwayne Wade saying that didn't go, that, that's not how we did it in Miami. That's yep. <laughs> tell, telling Jimmy, you know, so that's uh, that's amazing. Um, going on to the Knicks series, you and I basically have a great disdain for the Knicks. I'm a little bit older than you, so I remember those John Starks, you know, Alonzo Morning getting into fist fights and stepping on Jeff Van Gundy, you know, and so on. So, but you have, but I mean, I can't stand New York. You know, and and this series resonated with me as well. Um, the Heat went four a uh, four games to two. I do think one of the main reasons why the, the the New York Knicks even won two games is because of Jalen Brunson, you know, in particular. So, um, what did you see in the series that that resonated? How good the Miami Heat really? Are? First, of all, I also want to know who else picked New York because everywhere else I heard the Heat were the favorite amongst amongst the pundits. Oh no no no! Um, oh really? No, the, the Knicks were the betting favorite. Okay. And, um, if you go back and look, there there were it, it wasn't as lopsided as the Milwaukee, Boston, or Nuggets. Okay. Series. I think uh, more people, especially after the way the Heat played in that first round, I think more people were giving Miami credit going into a series against New York. But let's not forget, like New York just totally wiped the floor with Cleveland and Donovan Mitchell really? and Darius Garland. Like these are all guys that. You know, everybody was high on going into the the postseason, and uh, they had home court, and the Knicks beat them in five, and then they they kind of just just owned them in that game five in Cleveland too. So I, I think a lot of people were super high on New York, and uh, mo most of the uh, you know the 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 pundits, the national media who cover the NBA, most of them picked the New York Knicks. Like I, if you go back and look, I'm not saying it was 97 percent to three percent or whatever the stupid. Uh, ESPN analytics was against Boston, but um, mo most people were picking New York to win that series. And what bothered me wasn't that they were picking New York to win that series, because when you really look at it, you know, the Heat played a, a specific way and underperformed um, all throughout the regular season. And then they come in against Milwaukee, and you know, it's easy to kind of write this script. Well, Giannis misses three games. And the Heat shooters got hot. But can they sustain it, right? Jimmy Butler had a 56-point game. Can they sustain it? They were down 16 in game five and stormed all the way back. Is is that sustainable? And I think those are fair criticisms, right? When you, when you look at it outside of our bubble, those are fair criticisms to say, 
New York has home court. Uh, they, they just got rid of, of the Cleveland Cavaliers and played very well. They out-rebounded the Cavs, which is you know a main reason why they were able to win that series. They just dominated them on the glass. And what's a huge um, you know, part of Miami's game that, that that was clearly flawed was their 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 depth down low next to Bam Adebayo. Can Kevin Love continue to play it? You know, so we do all this, and I don't mind that they're picking New York. What did bother me was that they're saying New York has much more talent than Miami. And you saw that quickly. Like, it, it, it's, it's mind-boggling because anybody who watched that series who comes away thinking that the Knicks were more talented than Miami, outside of Jalen Brunson, that team is not more talented than this Miami Heat team. Like, it's not even close. Um, and we hadn't even seen Caleb Martin explode onto the scene the way he did in that Boston series yet. Like, the, the Heat role players, without Tyler Hero, were much more talented, not only in that series, but throughout the entire postseason, than the New York Knicks role players. And everybody talked about the depth from New York, and Miami's bench outplayed New York's bench the entire series long. Um, they won game two because Jimmy Butler didn't play. It's that simple. That's that That series ends in game four in Miami if Jimmy Butler doesn't get taken out of the game because Josh Hart is an, is a dummy. Like it, it, it's that to me, it's that simple. And um, like it, it only goes to six because the heat lose game two because Jimmy Butler doesn't play, even though they had a six point lead in the fourth quarter in that game, there was that awful call by yeah. Scott Foster where he calls a 24 second violation that clearly, clearly wasn't a 24 second violation. That's not why the heat lost, but Jimmy Butler plays game two. They probably win that game two in New York. And they won both home games. That series is a sweep, total sweep. But that so, wasn't the only bad call, though. They had, they had the call where I forgot. I think it was on Bam where he ran through a screen, and uh, I think it was Brunson was shooting a three, and he hadn't shot it yet, and they ruled it a three pointer plus, you know, I think plus <laughs> uh the, the 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 shot, and then it was like basically a six point swing. Yeah, you know that that occurred. So it, I mean, I, I I know because I literally butchered Scott Foster on my social media, you know, after that game <laughs> and blamed them for everything. And, and said he should be fired and, you know, an NBA refs of the worst in the league and, you know, and so yeah. on. So I remember that was a six point swing that, 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 that bad call on Bam, you know, led to. Even with, with that being said, um, the Heat still had a one point lead with around a minute and change left in that game. And they, they still should have won that game. But without Jimmy Butler, who you expect to close out those types of games, you know, they lose that. I don't think anybody was upset. You got the split in New York, came back to Miami. I mean, they won games three and four um, pretty comfortably. So uh, they go back to New York, game five, New York backs against the wall. Jimmy's still clearly a little bit hobbled uh, from that ankle injury. And um, and then it comes back game six. And I, I mean, there, there was no chance New York was going to win that series at that point. But um, yeah, I, that, that's what bothered me. It wasn't that people were picking the Knicks because I, I understood that, right? Uh, you know, the Heat have to prove to everybody that they can sustain the level of play that we saw in the first round against Milwaukee. But to say that that team was more talented, like at OB Toppin and Emmanuel Quigley being uh, the, the better duo off the bench than, than, you know, what the Heat were able to bring off the bench. And it, I, I just, I, I never understood it. Quickly played really well during the regular season, uh, but it didn't translate into the playoffs. As it as it rarely does for elite role players off the bench who have no playoff experience. That's a that, that's a Knicks team that outside of Jalen Brunson the year before with Dallas, I mean they have no playoff experience other than that first round against another team that they beat with zero playoff experience. And the Heat had been there before with that same core just a year prior, and it all clicked for them in the first round. And you saw it. And to me, what was most impressive was in the first round they did it by shooting threes. And Jimmy Butler just having insane Jimmy Butler games, right? Against New York, that's not how they did it. And they didn't allow Mitchell Robinson to take over that series the way he did against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, you, you saw a much better Bam Adebayo as well after Brooke Lopez had kind of kept him from his offensive game. And you just saw a bunch of guys playing a gritty series. And that, to me, is what stood out, that they didn't just do it by getting hot and shooting 40% or more from three, they did it in other ways that I, I think 
made this Heat run so special because they had the games and the series where they were just hot from three, and that's how they won. They had the Jimmy Butler epic performances. They had the fourth quarter comebacks, but they also showed that when it came time to playing your typical Heat style, right, that brand of Heat basketball, which is just the the tougher team, the team with more hustle, the team that was just going to beat you defensively, which is supposed to be Thibodeau's thing, it, it, it was the Miami Heat all day. And this idea that Thibodeau was the Jimmy Butler stopper, we we threw that out the window. Like, I, it, it just made me so happy. It just got rid of the Knicks. Everything that everybody said going into that series never came to fruition because the Heat were just the better overall team. Yeah. I personally think Tom Thibodeau is one of the most overrated coaches in the <laughs> NBA. It is unbelievable. I remember years ago, they they put him with uh, Greg Popovich and Doc Rivers, you know, as a top three. And the only reason why they put him, they wouldn't put Eric Spolstra is because he had LeBron James. And I used yeah, to say... You, you, you see that, right? Because uh, uh, look at uh, Mike Boonholzer and Tom Thibodeau have both yeah. won Coach of the Year awards. Yeah, and, and and Spo is ten times a coach that either of those guys are. Absolutely, um, and and he doesn't get that credit because he had the big three, he had LeBron James, um, but since being removed of the big three, like we we've seen some master classes from Coach yeah, Spo. That absolutely. first round in Milwaukee is one of them. That series against New York, like I think he out coached Tom Thibodeau, and then you know Eastern Conference Finals, it's not even close who the the better coach was, obviously, but. Who, who's who, like what coach put his imprint on that series? It was Coach Spo, and I, I think that that's also one special part about this run that I think Spo, outside of of Miami, a lot of people always kind of looked at him as a good coach, well respected, right? The people around the league that really know the game, they've always respected Coach Spo. But I think the common casual NBA fan always just looked at him as, well, he won two rings because he had LeBron James, and I yeah. think this this run really separated Coach Spo from being a guy with two rings just because he had LeBron yeah. and put him in that status of, you know, the best coach in the NBA. Yeah, but I've always thought that argument was stupid. And let me tell you why. Because you've had coaches that who, what coach and who's in the Hall of Fame has never won an NBA championship, you know, without superstars. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example. When Larry Brown won with that Pistons team, everybody, oh, that's just a bunch of blue collar guys. All those guys are in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Well, it's Hamilton, Chauncey Billups, you know, Ben Wallace was defensive player of the year. There's no such thing as an NBA coach who doesn't win championships with outstar players, okay? Especially more than two sometimes. It's it's never been done. You know, so so for, for the fan, so so people, oh, you know, yeah, LeBron James, so freaking what? You know, it took Phil Jackson for Kobe Ring for Kobe Bryant to finally get a ring with Shaq. You know, so that's that, that's all that's all I'm pretty much saying. So yeah, but Tom Tibble's always been, oh, Tom Tibble is great. Oh, Doc Rick, both have been fired, <laughs> you know. And 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 Spo's still going, and and Spo's done it with less. If you really want to get technical, you know, I I, I hate I know they hate uses her, the term the undrafted guys, but let's be honest, you know, these are guys that people didn't really give a chance. Guys like Struess and Vincent and Martin didn't really give a chance to, and he you know saw something. Let's let's give credit to Andy Ellisberg and and his and his scouting squad, you know, that brought them in and and, and found a role for them on the team, and they've been quite successful. And especially beating Boston, who you know, honestly you can make a real case is more talented on paper than the Miami Heat. You know they it took seven games. You know uh, they it was a miraculous comeback uh, being up uh, being down three three zero, but the Miami Heat again you know were able to 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 win that to win that series. That that's kind of been consistent throughout the Spo tenure, right? Uh, yeah. If you want to move past the big three, fine, but look at every team since then. There's always a handful of guys that we could go through every roster if you want, where he's able to maximize a a select group of, of individuals who on other teams probably would have just been guys down at the end of the bench. You know, a good example is uh, Derek Jones Jr. to me. Huge part of the Heat's 2020 bubble run. I'm not saying that he was as big as Jimmy Butler, or Bam Adebayo, or Goran Dragic, but if you remember that team, Derek Jones Jr., found a really nice spot for himself in Miami, found a really good role niche for himself within the Heat organization. Yeah. And then, like so many guys, he went out like Struess and Gabe Vincent will probably do this year. He went out and he got himself a nice long-term deal. And, and what has he done with Chicago, right? He's kind of just been another guy on that team. He hasn't been able to replicate that same production that he had in Miami. And, and we can go through a, a list of guys just like that where they come to Miami, 
they become really solid role players and then they go elsewhere and they kind of just fizzle out of the league. And I think that's something Eric Spolstra and his staff, right? And the, the ability of the Miami Heat staff in general, led by Pat, who picked Coach Spo. That's some, that that's one of the conversations I love to have where, you know, 2008, Pat Riley has this young superstar in Dwayne Wade. And we know he's a superstar and he's coming off a tough season where he didn't play because of knee injuries, but it's now becoming the second era of the Dwayne Wade era, right? The, the next chapter of the Dwayne Wade era in, in the Miami Heat organization, Pat Riley decides to step aside. And, and if you really go back and think about it, Pat Riley can say, okay, I have this young superstar. We know we're going to build around him. May take us a year or two, but they have that foresight, right? We're going to build around this young superstar who's established himself in the league as one of the guys to win a title and the first player in a long time. And is still the only player since then, actually 17 years ago today, by the way, to yeah. do it on his rookie deal, to be the MVP of the NBA finals on his rookie deal. Hadn't been done since I think Tim Duncan or, or David Robinson. And he doesn't, you know, it could have been easy for him to go out and look for a, a, a coach who's established around the league right? Who has experience working with young superstars like Dwayne Wade. Instead, he picks the guy out of his video room. And to me, like look no further than everything you need to know about Pat Riley and Eric Spolstra, that, that Pat had that foresight to know that this is the guy. And then to go through the, the triumphs and, 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 you know, the, the, the downs of a young inexperienced head coach, because then you bring in the big three, two years later, let's not forget Two years where Coach Bo lost in the first round with Dwayne Wade. Yeah. They lose in seven in 08-09 to the Atlanta Hawks, a series they should have won. And then the following year, they lose in five to the Boston Celtics. Right there, Pat Riley could have said, all right, we're going to go elsewhere, right? This this coach kind of proved that, you know, he can't win in the playoffs. And he does, and he sticks to his guy. You put this super team together, and things were a little choppy at the very beginning. And now we know that at some point, LeBron James asked Coach Pat, if he ever gets the itch to come back to coach. And we can kind of, I think in, in, in a good faith argument, insinuate that LeBron James wanted Pat Riley to come down and coach that team. And Pat Riley refused. And he refused to replace his guy. Just think, like, if you really sit and think there, what, what Pat was up against, which was legacy, his legacy as a president, uh, LeBron James's legacy, like it would have been so easy and think of how many other GMs, how many other presidents, how many other owners would have kind of came in and said, Hey, we have to go get another coach. We have to go get an established coach, somebody who's done it. And Pat Denny stuck by his guy. And to me, like that, that is a huge defining moment of this heat organization. And it tells you everything you need to know where they, they do things the right way. And, um, and, and, you know, Co Coach Spoho proved that they made the right decision, right? Because he's become the best coach in the NBA. I don't, I don't even think it's a discussion anymore. Like, he is the best coach in the NBA. And he's constantly been able, with less, to make more. Constantly. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. I think he is the best coach in the NBA. Because yeah, he's, uh, he's done a lot with less. You know, and again, he took a guy like Jimmy Butler, you know, we've talked about who's burned bridges everywhere he's gone. It's seen as just a good player, but not a superstar. And he's made him, you know, into basically a, a superstar, you know, because when he's in the, when he's been in the playoffs, he's been very successful. And against Boston as well, you know, although he kind of fizzled, you know, out, you could say a little bit, you know, towards the end of the series, had a couple hits here and there. You know, he was the first three games, he was a monster. I mean, who could forget the Grant Williams, you know, in your face, you know, um you know a type of confrontation so i mean you have to give you have to give um eric you know his his due you know he is a very good coach he gets the best out of his players and he's one of the main reasons why that team went to the nba finals this year because he was able to keep them together well look look at you know that's why i get so frustrated with heat fan too even now where they're a week removed from the nba finals and they're just so focused on whales and whatever and like i'm with you man i i want i know we'll get into it because you, you you gave me the rundown before. Like, okay. I want Dame Lillard as much as anybody. So, <laughs> well, like, I, I, I want that. But the idea that Pat Riley is whiffing on, uh, on free agency, like, this team was just in the NBA Finals. Look at yeah. every right decision we just went through that they've made. Like, 
they deserve to have the trust of the fan base, even if they mess up, even if they make mistakes, which they have. Hassan Whiteside, Deion Waders, James Johnson, and look what they turned it into. Jimmy Butler for Josh Richardson. Go back, man. Look at all these organizations around the NBA. Look at Philadelphia. I mean, they have a superstar in Joel Embiid. How many first-round picks have they had? How long did they make their franchise suffer with the process for what? To have Jimmy Butler underneath them paired with Joel Embiid, which would be arguably the best duo in the NBA right now. And instead, they chose Ben Simmons, who's a dumpster fire, who they had to get rid of because the guy was afraid to shoot free throws and layups in the most pivotal moment of their biggest series. And Tobias Harris, who they preferred over Jimmy Butler. And, and they haven't been out of the second round in my lifetime other than the AI year when I was in second grade. Like, that, that's why I, I, I just find it infuriating as a lifelong uh, follower of this organization. I was a diehard Heat fan. was old right behind me. I, I find it infuriating that people are just so willing. And I know it's just social media or whatever, but they're just so willing to go on social media and say that this front office doesn't know what they're doing. And it's like, what what organization have you guys been following? Are you that spoiled as a fan base that just because they don't land the 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 premier whale or Oka or free agent that's available during that cycle that you're just gonna like just just start start slandering Pat Riley and Andy Ellsberg and Mickey Harrison and Coach Spo? Like I'll never understand that because time and time again, three separate eras in 17 years. Um, or, or four separate eras in 17 years, they've put together title runs. How many organizations in the NBA can say that? Not many. No, you can't say. Yeah, you really can. I mean, look how many times, multiple times in the 2000s, the Miami Heat have been, you know, to the NBA Finals. You know, they've won three championships out of it. They were in it, you know, this past season, and they beat some really good teams, all right? Milwaukee and Boston were no slouches, you know, uh, to say the least. You know, yeah, we're ignoring the Knicks. You know, we're no slouches. You know, those are those are very good teams, you know, and they, they've been competitive as well. And, you know, then they just happened to face a buzzsaw, you know, this time around with Denver. Denver was just, I guess you could say, destined to win. You know, Jokic is a beast. Yeah. You know, Jamal Murray, you know, is, is, is a stand-up guy, you know, a very good basketball player. That team is well coached. The only thing I will say, um, I will say is that, I don't know if you agree with me, the first three games of that series, I mean, the Heat won game two. But I don't think Denver's defense was really that good. I just don't think Miami hit shots. You know, yeah. that's the that's the way I saw it. Like I just thought that the Heat just missed a lot of opportunities to, to you know to hit their like they're basically their threes fizzled out. But I will say one thing. I don't know if you agree with me, Alejandro. I don't think Bam respected Jokic's defense at all because I had never seen that man so aggressive against anybody. You know, throughout the playoff run, like he went after Jokic. Like, what do you think about that? That Bam didn't respect Jokic's defense. Well, I'm, I'm just, I mean, he, he probably did, but I'm just saying, like, the way, the, as aggressive as he was, I right. think he felt like he could take him, you know, uh, whenever yeah. he wanted to. Yeah. And, and that, that is one of the, when, when the Jokic and beat arguments were, were taking place, like, one of the biggest knocks on Jokic was his, his defensive liabilities or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but I also think it's the type of defense that Denver was playing as well. If you go back, and watch game one where Bam balled as well. I know the Heat don't win, but he yeah. really led that Heat team. He was the only player really that was able to to, to score consistently in games one and two. Um, outside of Gabe Vincent, like he he noticed that they're gonna let him shoot. And by the way, they should have allowed him to shoot because in uh that first round against Milwaukee, Brooke Lopez made his life hell. And then in that third round against Boston, like if you go back and look at the numbers. Bam Adebayo was not knocking down his jumper. No, he wasn't. Like he struggled to score from the mid-range like he was prior to the All-Star break when he became an All-Star. There's a stretch right before the All-Star break where I swear Bam dropped 30 and 15, like six games in a row. It felt that way anyways. And uh, and and after the All-Star break, you didn't really see that from Bam on a consistent level. And his, uh, his shooting percentages dropped. His shooting percentages from the mid-range specifically uh, dropped in a, in a big way. And, and, you know, Denver just figured we're going to do everything we can to game plan against Jimmy Butler and we'll make Bam out of bio beat us. And I think it was, it was the right call on their part. And Bam stepped up in a big way. Like nobody left that final series upset with Bam out of bio and his one, his aggression, because that was always 
you know, a big, uh, a big knock on Bam in the postseason, his aggression offensively, not defensively, but offensively, mm-hmm. and two, his abilities. Like, uh, on a national stage, everybody saw what he's capable of. And, um, but, but as far as that, that series goes, look, Denver was a better team. They had more talent. But the, the, the Heat, I, I think, are going to come away from that series. One, wishing Jimmy Butler was healthy. This is a big argument I've had with Hawk and Crowder, where Jimmy Butler downplays any sort of um, you know injury or anything, and I, I I think that's admirable. I love that. I think that's one of the things that Heat fans love about Jimmy Butler. He's not going to make excuses. He was out on the court, so it doesn't matter. And to a certain extent, that's true. But I think anybody who watched every game prior to his injury in Game One versus the Knicks, where Josh Hart takes him out, he was a different player after that injury. I think that caught up with him towards the end of the NBA Finals. Uh, But also, Denver did an amazing job at really making it difficult for him as well. And the heat shooting just, it it didn't keep up. Like I I think it's as simple as that. You went up against the best team in the NBA, in my opinion. Um, Going into the playoffs, that was my pick to win the NBA Finals. I thought everything kind of came together for Denver at the right time. And more importantly, Jamal Murray was healthy. And the last two postseasons, they were really good, but Jamal Murray wasn't healthy after he tore his ACL two years ago. So I think everything kind of came together for them. They went out. They got really good additions. Bruce Brown, Aaron Gordon, by the way, like he, I, I would love Aaron Gordon to be on the Miami Heat. Yeah. Uh, I didn't feel that way during the series, but like that's the kind of guy that that I think we would all uh, appreciate next to Bam Adebayo. And then, um, you know, Jokic is the best player in the league, bro. Like it, it, it's it's that simple. You ran out of gas against the best team in the NBA. And uh, it sucks because had Jimmy been healthy and your shooters not not gone cold for some of those games, you feel like the Heat could have given them a, a bit more of a run for their money. But ultimately, they, they were the better team. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I, I do think that that was the better team. You know, they hit their shots when needed to hit their shots. I did feel that they would, if the Miami Heat would have hit their shots a little bit more, it could yeah. have gone six games, you know, maybe even seven. You but know. that's that's the that's the worry with having guys like Max Struess and yeah. Gabe Vincent and Caleb Martin, who are, and and even Duncan Robinson, right? Who who are undrafted players who played above their expectations. Exactly. Yes. In the first, second, and third rounds. The, the, the worry is, are they going to be able to keep that up on the highest level against the other team who's the best team in the NBA? And yeah. you know, unfortunately, um, they like I said, they, they kind of just ran out of gas and, and they couldn't keep up that level of play, which is what the Heat needed. The Heat needed to go into that series and to win, they needed Jimmy Butler at his absolute best. They needed Bam out of bio at his absolute best. And they needed all their role players to shoot above 40% from three, like they did against Milwaukee and like they did against Boston. And it, it just didn't happen. So it, it's really that simple, in my opinion. No, I agree. Um, I will say this. I got to give the referees credit in that game five. They don't play in the fourth quarter. That yep. was the most entertaining fourth quarter I had seen in years. It actually reminded me of the of the 90s when they were, when bodies just flew everywhere. So yeah. I have to hand it to the referees for for allowing them, you know, basically to play basketball and not call every single whistle. You know, as well. So you, you brought up a good point, and, and it's been talked about. So you do feel that Jimmy Butler was still um, slightly injured from that injury against Josh Hart in the Knicks series? Yeah, I, look, um, that, I, I laugh because Hawk and I have, have done this on the air like 30 times where he's telling me, Jimmy Butler's telling you it wasn't a big deal. Coach Spose, or, or he, not that it wasn't a big deal. Jimmy Butler's telling you it wasn't at all a factor because that's what Jimmy Butler said after. He said, no excuses. I'm not going to talk about the ankle. Uh, Coach Spo said no excuses. Jimmy said he was fine. And then Pat Riley today had the opportunity in his end of year presser to at some point allude to the ankle injury, and he didn't. So, um, you know, nobody's making that excuse in the heat locker room, which again, I love. Like, I love that. I love the fact that that's the way that they approach this, right? It's not, well, had we been healthy, well, you know, every team is going through their injuries at the end of the season. So, you know, it is what it is. You're on that stage. You're there. Now it's time to uh, to, to produce and win. Um, but, I, like, and that's fine. But anybody who's, who, who watched that series that also couldn't just acknowledge that Jimmy Butler wasn't at 
then you know I, I I don't think you're watching the same games I were because the amount of times that Jimmy Butler drove into the paint, jump stopped in the paint, and at no point had any desire to actually score and turn his body around, elevate off off a off a hop step, elevate and score, which he was doing at will in the first round. Like that that's not Jimmy Butler. It's just not. All first round, he was knocking down the uh the 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 mid-range jumper from the baseline on either side, just getting to his spot, elevating over whoever was in front of him. And you rarely saw that from Jimmy Butler in that series. And uh, there were a lot of games where it took him a while to really kind of get into the flow of the offense. It took him a while to even really make his impact on either end of the floor. And and to me, like you credit Denver, you have to. I, I'm not I'm not saying that you know Denver didn't do things really well to scheme up defensively against Jimmy and to make it as tough as possible against them. They certainly did, but. Jimmy Butler wasn't 100% healthy in the NBA Finals, and uh, and and nobody will be able to convince me otherwise. I, to me, it's it, it's just a matter of watching him play, and and a lot of the things that he was doing in the first round, and even after the All Star break, Ethan Skolnick from Five Reasons Five Reasons Sports. I remember him mentioning this on one of his podcasts, where after the All Star break, he was shooting like 60% from from twos, like two point uh, attempts, shooting like above 60%. And the amount of games that he finished with a field goal percentage above 50% was like, I don't remember the exact numbers right now off the top of my head, but they were like, it was a ridiculous amount, like 10 or more up until the NBA finals. And then after that Josh Hart injury where, where he, he misses game two, after that, he had one game where he shot 50% or better from the field and every other game was below 50%. And that mm-hmm. com- that comes down to, the types of attempts that you're getting, right? Where you're shooting from. It it comes down to the fact that he was settling for jump shots a lot more, longer jump shots than we were used to watching him, which he's not a, a, as an efficient player shooting from from deep, right? He's not as efficient of a three-point shooter or 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 a player from around uh the the deep twos as he is around the rim. And then go look at his free throw attempts each game. Like it, it, it pales in comparison to the guy we saw against Milwaukee, who was averaging easy twelve field goal or attempt. I'm sorry, twelve free throw attempts per game. So, um, like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty dead fast in my my take here that Jimmy was hurt, and the fact that that he wants to j- just totally avoid talking about it, I'm cool with. Like, I'm not saying that the Heat lost the finals because he was hurt. I just. I, I refuse to acknowledge the fact that it had nothing to do with the series. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Also, I, one thing that I noticed is that his facial expressions weren't the same like they were, you know, in Milwaukee, New York, and even Boston. You, you could tell like they're, they're, he wasn't the same guy, you know, where he's smiling at, at the opponent, he's talking trash, you know, and so on. Like his facial expressions about the same. Well, so you, I don't it, know. I mean, we we got that with like Grant Williams and. Yeah, uh, but not in the finals though. You know, not in the finals though. I mean, and I do think he kind of. In many cases, he did extend himself, like you said. He ran out of gas, you know. So he he's he goes he goes at it a one hundred percent, you know, whether it's offense or defense. He's gonna try to score on you, and he's also gonna try to defend your best player. So I think that's that's what I mean, you know. So like towards the end of that Denver Nugget series in particular, his facial expressions were not the same. No, yeah, the Grant Williams thing was hilarious, you know, when he got in his face. But you could have made a case. Um, you could you know I noticed it more towards the end of the Boston series. When Caleb Martin actually took over more of the scoring duties for the Miami Heat, and people were making the argument that you could have gone either way with Jimmy Butler or even Caleb Martin to win the MVP for the Eastern Conference Finals in that series. Yeah, yeah, but but I mean, uh, you know that that again goes back to, you know, how much the Heat relied on on those types of guys yeah. to get them to the finals, and and I think part of it was because, you know, you just didn't have that same Jimmy Butler that you had in the first round, who was totally healthy. And it was just playing at like this astronomical level. And you didn't have that, but you still had a Jimmy Butler who was engaged in the series, still yeah. doing everything he could in the most important moments and was still carrying this team. Like it, it is funny where I talk about Jimmy being a bit hobbled or whatever. He's still like scoring 28 points per game in the finals yeah. or whatever. Like he, and he, and in game five, he had that, that 12 point stretch where he scored 12 straight or 13 straight for the heat, knocked down a couple three pointers. That is true. You're right about um, that. That is true. But um, but again, like 
he he wasn't he wasn't a hundred percent. He he wasn't. And again, a, a lot of teams aren't come come the finals or come the, the playoffs. So it's not an excuse. I'm not saying that the Heat lost because of that. I, I just wish we would have seen a healthy, totally healthy Jimmy Butler. I think it it maybe would have uh would have would have been a, a bit of a different series had that been the case. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. Um, one of the things we want to talk about now is free agency, right? And trades yeah. as well. Um, I was a Bradley Beal fan, you know, but I, I, I've gone uh, the route of, of your buddy, Brandon Tobin, you know, in particular, where he doesn't want to hear about Bradley Beal because he's like that girl that flirts with you and then goes with the other the other <laughs> individual, you know, and he did it to the Heat again, right? The Miami Heat were supposed to be his team and then Phoenix comes along and he goes with Phoenix. Um, I personally am a Dame Lillard fan. I do think that for me, if you could trade for someone like Damian Lillard to alleviate some of the scoring duties, you know, for a Jimmy Butler and a Bam and a bio, my personal take, I don't know how you feel about this. I'd rather draft a big man, you know, in the first round and get Damian Lillard, you know, to run point, you know, and also be like a combo guard, like, you know, that, that scores as well, you know, to help also alleviate some of the duties of having Bam and a bio guard everybody's, you know, number five on the team. You know, and I think that would help a lot. You know, we saw a little bit of that with the Knicks and Jalen Brunson, how he alleviated a lot of the scoring duties for Julius Randle, even though Julius Randle totally disappeared, you know, in the second round. But Jalen Brunson, you know, kept that team afloat. Like, how do you feel about the whole Damian Litter to Miami thing? Do you think that we should not, you know, touch it? You know, just keep things at, at, at status quo, you know, maybe draft a little bit, maybe uh, pick up some more free agents. What do you think, Alejandro? No, I look, it's very simple to me. You saw how close you were. Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, that core is good enough to get to get you to the NBA Finals. Period. They've done it now with two separate teams. You're you're close. You need to get over the edge though. Damian Lillard puts you there. It's it's that simple. Uh, he he'd probably be the best player on the team uh, between him and Jimmy Butler. He's probably better than Jimmy Butler, uh, and that's not a slide at Jimmy. Like I think Damian Lillard now for the past decade maybe a little bit less has been a top 10 player in the nba consistently yeah. and look I, I i do think the heat needs some help with with their their big depth like i i'm with i'm with a lot of people there i i'm totally out on this idea that bam is a four and that the heat need a traditional five i i don't subscribe to that mentality right. at all um i know i know a lot of people do and I'm not saying that I wouldn't be opposed to bringing in a big man to play alongside Bam. If if, if that were the case, I'd be. I, I'm not against that. But the idea that that's their number one need to me is just incorrect because Spo has shown us time and time again, most important minutes, he's going to play Bam at the five and he's going to play small, and that's what he's going to do. So the idea that the Heat, their their most, you know. Uh, their utmost need is a is a big to me is you're 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 totally misreading what I think we saw in these finals, which was they need scoring. Tyler Hero would have helped in a huge way. They need scoring, and now you're telling me that you can replace Gabe Vincent or Max Struess with arguably the best scoring point guard or combo guard in the game. Like it's a no brainer. I I empty the tank for or empty the farm for Damian Lillard. I really do. And I love Tyler Hero. Um, I think Pat Riley really holds Hero in, in high regard. We heard him today talk about Tyler and Bam um, you know, being being focal points for this organization along with Jimmy Butler. So I don't know how likely it is that they trade Tyler Hero. I don't know. But if you're telling me right now, and I, I just hate trading away a guy like Tyler Hero because dude's 23 years old, you know, uh, like his ceiling, we don't know it yet. But as much as a lot of people will tell you that they know, we don't. He's 23, you know. No, A lot of people thought they had Jimmy Butler figured out at 26. And here we are eight years later, and look what he's doing in the NBA Finals. So you nobody knows what Tyler's ceiling is. Um but you're telling me right now that you can have Damian Lillard? Like, I I go for it, man. Uh, th this is the, the last couple years of the Jimmy Butler era. He's 34 years old. Um, he has three, four more years really left in him playing at a high level, maybe less. And you're this close, 
and you you have an opportunity now to land one of the best players in the NBA who's who's hungry as as hungry as anybody is for a title because he hasn't even tasted it. He hasn't even been in the finals. I I say you go for it. I really do. And look, Tyler Hero and Bam Adebayo, their two-man game was was probably one of the more efficient um actions that the Heat were able to implement all season long on the offensive side. Just think about how lethal it would be. Two man game. Damian Lillard, Bam at a bio. It allows Jimmy Butler to not have to score as much. Uh let him be more of a game manager and and just just always make the right basketball play, knowing that he has maybe the most clutch player in the NBA ready for him to just take over the scoring load. Like to me, it's a no brainer. It's a perfect fit. And if the Heat can get it done, I think they should do everything they possibly can outside of moving Jimmy or Bam to get it done. Yeah, I agree. I was going to ask you, but you answered my question. You know, I've always been a not trade Tyler guy, but I think that, you know, to get a... I just think that if you hold on to Tyler Hero, you'll be back at square one in a couple of years because Jimmy Butler will eventually, you know, retire. And when, and when Tyler Hero hits his peak, you're right back at square one. I think if you want to win now... Uh, Tyler Hero is a tra- is a marketable piece. He is a former six man of the year. And the way that these role players played in the playoffs and showed how gutsy and gritty they are, they become tradable commodities. Even Duncan Robinson, who's Hawks' favorite guy, you know, in particular, has has given himself some value again because he did play well in these finals and hitting threes and yeah. also in the Boston series as well when Tyler got hurt. So I think if you can make a deal to get Damian Lillard, you know, on this basketball team. You do it. You have a point guard. You, know, you have a point guard, and then you have, and then you have a good compliments with Jimmy Butler and Bam and Abayo as well. And yeah, that pick and roll game will be absolutely lethal. You know, with um, with D. Liller on this team. So I, I, I don't see how you just don't make that deal. Yeah. Again, I, I hate the idea of like how how willing people are to just say, oh, just move Bam or move Tyler or whatever. Like I, I'm not. I, I hate that because I like Tyler Hero. I, I happen to love Tyler Hero, um, but. As much as I was just vouching there for us not knowing his ceiling, it's never going to be Damian Lillard. He's never going to be a top five player in the NBA. Dame, I don't know if he still is, um, but at one point, the top five player in the NBA, and it wasn't even close. Like he, he was top five, easy. Um, I don't know if he still is. Uh, that's an argument for another day, but he's not going to be that. And you get Dame. Like I mentioned, back end of his career, I know, but dude just had more points per game than he ever did when he was available this year. He had his highest uh, scoring season of his career. And like I mentioned, that dude is hungry for a title. I mean, he's literally trying to flip the entire uh, uh, Portland organization upside down just because he's hungry for a title. He wants to compete now. And you're there. Like I, like I mentioned, you're there. You're, 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 you're tasting the title. You've been in the finals two of the last four years. You've been in the conference finals three of the last four years. You clearly have the core with Jimmy and Bam. And I would love to to see Tyler Hero stick around. Love it. But if he's the difference between you getting Damian Lillard or not, I, I think the Heat would would ultimately decide that that it, it's worth moving him for that. I totally agree with you, especially since you've been so close. You know, yeah. and again, and Pat Riley, we know how Pat Riley is. He's a must win. He wants to win before he retires. And these so windows close, man. These windows close. Like you, you don't. That, that's why I'm always, I'm always telling myself, you know, you don't, you can't take this stuff for granted because these windows close. You don't know what will happen two, three years down the line. You're, you're this close, which is why I think the Heat. If, if this is all, who knows, right? Who, who really knows what's going on behind the scenes? But if this is all legitimate, and the Heat really do have this opportunity to go land Damian Lillard, um, you, you take advantage of, of those opportunities. Who knows who's going to be available next year? Look what the Heat did with Giannis, right? They kind of played the waiting game with Giannis. It didn't work out. They played the waiting game with Kevin Durant. It didn't work out. Uh, d- don't, don't play the waiting game. When you're able to go get a top 10 player in the NBA and you're this close to a title and that's who you can add, I, I think Pat Riley has shown us that he's all in. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, and I and I do think that hopefully the the, the one benefit is that Dame Lillard and Bam Adebayo are friends. 
So that yeah. kind of that does uh, that does help Miami's favor, you know, as far as he was very quick to answer with his interview. What team would you like? Miami Heat? Like it was like just right then. Now we're going to the Heat, you know. So that's uh, so I and listen. He fits in well here, uh, culturally speaking. The, the Heat are a team that he would embrace, you know, and they'll embrace him as well. And yeah, so I think I, I, I think in terms of like the 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 personality fit and just the type of person he is, I think this is a, a an organization that that most people hold in in a very high regard around around the league with the way that they conduct themselves. So uh, he he seems like you know first class guy or whatever. I'm with you. I like the fit as far as him being friends with Bam. I think that matters. It's important. But at the end of the day, this is simply going to come down to is Damian Lillard really going to leave. Or is he just doing this thing again where he's trying to make some noise, trying to pressure the the Blazers to to kind of succumb to his wishes, which is to build a contender there. And the only way he ends up in Miami is if he goes to Portland and he says, trade me to Miami. And I like that. That's it. Because when you look at who can offer better deals around the league, I think the Heat starting with Tyler Hero and then you know, a multitude of picks, it's a good offer that they can, that they can, you know, piece together. But Brooklyn clearly can outdo Miami in terms of, of just draft capital and future draft capital. I mean, they just got everything and more from Phoenix and, uh, and, and, and Dallas. So, uh, but, but does Dame want to go to, to, to Brooklyn? I know he's really good friends with Macau Bridges. I know he mentioned Brooklyn as one of those teams. Yeah, he did. But, but is Brooklyn close to a title? I don't think anybody would say that they are, even adding Damian Lillard. And if he's if he's you know legit trying to just join a contender, a team that's ready to win now, there aren't many better options than the Miami Heat. Yeah. Well, Alejandro, thank you so much again for joining us. It's always a pleasure having you on here. Your expertise. You know, as well. If you want to see more of Alejandro Solana, you can find him anywhere. You can find him on Odyssey if you like. You can find him on 560 WQEM. You know, he's on the Hawkman and Crowder show. Show starts at from 2 to 6 p.m. He, he's also, like I said, he's the host of Heat Pregame. So when the Miami Heat, if you want to listen to him on the radio, he's on as well. Let's not forget, he's also as a producer of the Miami Dolphins as well. Miami Dolphin broadcast. And he is the host of the Porpoise Pod alongside his buddy Brandon Tobin. Okay. Alejandro, you want to say anything else? I was just going to say, uh, we're doing a, for those who uh, who are interested, we're doing a live draft show Thursday, the day of the draft, on QAM. Starting at 8, Heat don't pick till 18. Who knows what may happen prior to that? Maybe a Damian Lillard trade, but on 560, for any of those people who are uh, interested in live draft coverage, Heat-centered live draft coverage on QAM on Thursday. Awesome. There you go, right? So if you want to... Join Alana Solana, Hawkman, and Crowder as well, you know, as far as uh, draft coverage for the Miami Heat. Tune in Thursday, all right, as well for uh, Alejandro Solana. All right, everybody, once again, Alejandro, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, I am Will. If you like what you heard, please do not forget to like, share, and subscribe to 305 Sports Now. Once again, I am Will. Stay safe. God bless. See you soon.